Not long ago, China's permanent representative to the UN, Zhang Jun, made a statement demanding an international investigation into the crimes committed by the United States. And interestingly, among the extermination of Indians and the killing of civilians in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, the Great Depression was also named. The Great Depression refers to the global economic crisis of 1929 to 1939. This crisis led to the collapse of many world economies and caused numerous social problems. These problems contributed to Hitler's rise to power in Germany. Therefore, many researchers call the Great Depression one of the main causes of World War II. At the same time, in the West there is a widespread point of view that the Great Depression was caused solely by economic problems, namely, the overproduction crisis. And not much is heard, for example, about collusion on the London and New York stock exchanges. Well, let's take a look at this. It's believed that the economic crisis was the result of a massive fall in stock prices on the U.S. stock exchanges in October 1929. In reality, this stock market crash, known as the Wall Street Crash, was triggered by another event. A month before the collapse of American stocks, on September 20, 1929, another stock exchange collapsed, the London one. After the end of the World War I, the United States was the largest creditor of the United Kingdom. The collapse of the London Stock Exchange meant a technical default on England's foreign debt. After that, the domino effect worked. Following the London Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange collapsed. After that, the US government announced a temporary external payments freeze. This led to the collapse of the economies of those countries that had invested in the states. The collapse of the London Stock Exchange was investigated by the Attorney General's Office for England and Wales, after which a trial took place. The court found that the stock market crash on the London Stock Exchange, and therefore on the New York Stock Exchange, was the result of several brokers' fraudulent actions. All of them were sentenced to various terms of imprisonment for fraud and forgery of documents, but were soon released and they continued to successfully engage in their business. So the words about the overproduction crisis, to put it mildly, are superficial, and, strictly speaking, they are simply pronounced in order to distract and cloud reality. Actually, the fact of conspiracy was even legally established. Another thing is that it wasn't about the collusion of several brokers, but about the international conspiracy of a number of English-American bankers. This circumstance is supported by the fact that the convicted brokers were in constant contact with the leadership of the Bank of England. In addition, six months before the crisis, on March 25, 1929, the U.S. Federal Reserve officially warned of the existence of fraudulent stock speculation on the New York and London stock exchanges. The Fed's statement made clear the threat of a stock market crash. One detail, having announced this, the financial regulator did nothing to prevent this catastrophe. But we'll return to this a little bit later. Now let's look at some other facts. In the United States about 45% of banks completely went bankrupt, and their depositors lost more than $40 billion of funds, which is about $660 billion in today's prices. Within a few months, the American middle class completely disappeared, and an army of unemployed emerged in its place. The number of unemployed increased from 3% to 25% of the workforce. The situation of those who managed to keep their business, their work, turned out to be not much better. Their average income fell by 60%. In general, 50% of the working population fell into poverty. For example, an eloquent photograph of those years. The poster reads, I know three trades, I speak three languages, fought for three years, have three children and no work for three months. But I only want one job. And some wrote ads like this. $100 will buy this car. Must have cash. Lost all on the stock market. To all this there was also added a severe drought that hit the United States and caused massive starvation. In West Virginia, Illinois, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania, up to 90% of the population starved during this period. The number of deaths from starvation hasn't yet been revealed, but dry statistics indicate a demographic collapse. If in the relatively prosperous 1920s the growth of the U.S. population was 16.2%, then in the 1930s it fell more than twice, to 7.3%. Against this background, the federal structures not only didn't take any steps to moderate the depression, but, on the contrary, began to suppress those who called on the government to develop a program to overcome the crisis. The most egregious massacre of the participants of the Hunger March took place in Washington in July 1932. 
its participants, veterans of the World War I, only demanded to resolve the problem of non-payment of funds due to their contracts with the U.S. Army. Their actions were held exclusively in a peaceful manner, and they were unarmed. Nevertheless, the government sent in tanks at them followed by units of the regular army in gas masks. A gas of unknown origin was used against the veterans, and the number of victims hasn't been revealed so far. From the point of view of maintaining order, this and similar actions didn't make any sense. The point was to intimidate society proper to the most important stage of the heist, the seizure of gold from the population. In April 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt signed a decree on de facto confiscation from the population and associations of gold, which was in bars and coins. Formally, the government undertook to pay a reward for voluntarily surrendered precious metals at a price of about $21 per troy ounce. Taking into account the rapid devaluation of the dollar, this price was almost three times lower than the actual value of the surrendered gold bars. At the same time, gold was simply confiscated from part of the population without any payment. But why was such a large-scale and brazen heist needed? There are two goals that can be distinguished. First of all, the Great Depression made it possible to beat out competitors. Several thousand banks that owned stakes in the Bank of England and the Fed went bankrupt. Another goal was to create a gold reserve to back the new world currency. In the 1920s, the United States, having become a world creditor, came close to turning the dollar into a world currency. There was only one step left, and for this it was necessary to provide the Fed's unit of account with significant reserves of gold. Gold mining was at a low level at that time. Therefore, the heist of its own population was chosen as the most effective method. In the context of the crisis and the general impoverishment of the population, the gold reserves of the Fed doubled. By the beginning of the Great Depression, according to official data, it slightly exceeded 5,000 tons, and by the end it reached 10 and a half thousand tons. In connection with all this, it's interesting that the head of the Fed, Ben Shalom Bernanke, openly admitted the guilt of the Federal Reserve in 2002. In a public speech marking the 90th birthday of economist Milton Friedman, he agreed that the Great Depression was organized by the Federal Reserve. These are his words. I would like to say to Milton and Anna, regarding the Great Depression. You're right. We did it. We're very sorry. But thanks to you, we won't do it again. Of course, these words were said rather ambiguously. It meant that this was done out of ignorance, as if inadvertently. However, the fact remains that the words were spoken. It was his response to accusations by Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman, who along with his co-author Anna Schwartz, in the book The Monetary History of the United States, directly blamed the Fed for the Great Depression. In particular, Friedman argued that, the Federal Reserve was created to prevent what actually happened. It was created to avoid a situation where you'd have to close banks, where you'd have a banking crisis. And yet, under the Federal Reserve, you had the worst banking crisis in the history of the United States. I can think of no other example of a government measure that would produce results that were clearly the opposite of what was expected. And this unbelievable collapse of the banking system, when about a third of the banks collapse from beginning to end, when millions of people almost lose their savings, there was no need for this decline. At all times, the Federal Reserve has the power and the knowledge to stop this. And there were people at that time who called them to this all the time. One way or another, the World War II put an end to the so-called Great Depression. In the post-war period, the cyclic development of the capitalist economy, crisis, depression, revival, bloom, continued. But more on that some other time. Let me know by likes and comments if this topic is worth developing. Thank you for watching and see you in the future episodes on our channel.